Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to our in-person and virtual audiences tonight. My name is Stephen Davey. I'm the senior producer here at WBUR City Space. Um, Thank you all for coming out. I have an interesting story. So back in the spring, we were all meeting with the colleagues here at Here and Now uh, about a podcast series they were working on concerning whistleblowers and the Environmental Protection Agency. That series is called Captured. It's published now, and you can download it and stream it at wbur.org slash here and now. It's really good. Um, but as we were brainstorming, we were thinking about what would be an interesting conversation on whistleblowers and transparency for city space. And and kind of a lark, I said, you know, we should invite one of the most famous whistleblowers of the modern era, uh, Chelsea Manning. Great idea, yeah, 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 yeah. she's not gonna come. Um, unbeknownst to us though, Chelsea was working on her memoir, which was just published, and a perfect opportunity to bring her to Boston. Readme.txt, title as a nod to a file that Chelsea included in her leak of more than 700,000 classified military and diplomatic documents to WikiLeaks in 2011. That leak put Chelsea at the center of a massive controversy, and she's still both celebrated for her transparency advocacy and at the same time a lightning rod for her critics. One thing is certain, Chelsea has a lot to say, and she wants to tell her story. A quick thanks to our partners at Brookline Booksmith. You can grab a signed copy of readme.txt out in the lobby. It's fascinating, as you'll soon hear. And you can ask your questions, too. Head over to Slido, that's S-L-I dot D-O, and enter the word Manning. And you can uh, ask your questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. Now, please help me in welcoming to the City Space stage here and now co-hosts Robin Young and Chelsea Manning. Hi, everybody. There we go. Hi. Um, how many have read the book? Oh, this is exciting. OK, not as many. Exciting. Yes. Yeah. Well, you are Surprise. in. Surprise. You're in for such a treat. And by the way, you, you will be able to purchase them, and I can't uh, recommend it enough. This could have been so many books. Uh, one tells of growing up in Oklahoma in an increasingly violent alcoholic home where gender roles in Oklahoma are as hard and fixed as the land, great line. Yeah. Uh, knowing at the age of four you wanted to wear your beloved big sister's makeup. Um, <laughs> it also could have been a book about being a brilliant kid who began programming on a computer at six. Um, a different time and place, he would have been fast-tracked to MIT, but instead, after high school, he was on his own. It could have been a book about an early cyberpunk hacking music companies that cracked down on music sharing. Uh -huh. Um, early signs of a commitment to freedom of information. And it is definitely a behind-the-scenes look at military intelligence when young intelligence officers were required to see clear-eyed the truth of war but keep it a secret. And in Chelsea's case, also keep secret her gender dysphoria, her desperate knowledge that she was meant to be a woman in an era of don't ask, don't tell. Have I got it right? Yeah, it's, uh, there's more to it. <laughs> there is more to it. Uh, I wrote a book. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It is, it is quite the book. It's nail-biting, it's enraging, it's heartbreaking, it's really good. Chelsea Manning, welcome oh, again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and I want to start uh, where you do, because you start in the middle. Uh, January 2010, you've come home on leave from Iraq, fully, sure. di fully disillusioned. You have a memory card carrying every single incident report the US Army ever filed about Iraq and Afghanistan. This, up, up to the month before. Up to the month before, OK. This was going to be uh, the biggest leak in American history if you can get the internet in a local Barnes & Noble bookstore to work. Now, this struck me, because here is this incredible moment. It's going to change your life drastically. And yet, you know, it's not Matt Damon rappelling down a glass skyscraper to hand a thumb drive to Julian no, Assange. No, absolutely not. No. It's in a Barnes & Noble, and the internet is slow. Your thoughts in that moment? My thoughts in that moment? Uh, this isn't going to work. Uh, this is, um, I, you know, I, I genuinely was like, you know, just not meant to be because I had run out, you know, because there was the two weeks, it was two to three weeks before that, right, where, uh, you know, I sort of like had this, I had this in my mind that uh, I was finally going to try to, you know, re you know release uh, this information. 
Um, and, uh, and I wrote the, what is now the title of the book, uh, a readme file, uh, a readme.txt file. By the way, of, for those of us who aren't as geeky, this is something that comes along with documents online. It's the, the kind of how to read a document. Yeah, it's now, now they use markdown files. So it's a, it's been updated a little bit. So yeah, now it's at dot MD, but, um, you know, a convention at the time was still dot, dot txt. Um, and so I wrote this down and, uh, and basically was like, you know, this is my, you know, this, th here's my, here's my intention, right. To whoever receives this. And I had it in my mind because I lived in the DC area. This is going to go to the Washington post. Right. So I had this very, I, I had this like kind of, um, Woodward and Bernstein thing in my mind, um, about sort of a, 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 a handoff in a, you know, garage or something like that. Um, and it became very clear to me that, uh, that the digital, that the news media that I was interacting with hadn't really caught up with the digital age. And I just, and I was on leave in a, from Iraq. So I didn't really have a lot of time. Well, let's, let's, let's flesh that out because you did try to reach out to the Washington post. You did, did. try to reach to the New I York did. times. I got to, I got a conversation with somebody. Right. That. You said, yeah, I'm from defense. This is everything you want to know about the wars. Um, you tried to drive to Politico, but in addition to a slow internet, it's snowmageddon. Remember snowmageddon? Yeah. Like, you couldn't, you were digging out a car with yes. your bare hands. This is, it would be funny. Well, if, I had gloves. Okay. <laughs> no shovel. It would be funny if it weren't so serious. And f a failure, by the way, perhaps in journalism that nobody responded Technical to. Technical failure. Yeah. yeah. Was, uh, they didn't know how to read it. You know, the, 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 the information age was starting to hit all of these institutions for the first time. Right. They didn't know Even how to Even though read. I grew up in, I, I sort of grew up with the knowledge and understanding of it. Um, you know, especially encryption and things like that. Cause right. like, you know, the conversations I was having was like, well, can you just explain it to me in an email? And I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I can't. So um, a technical failure. Um, but you're risking everything and there are still people who call you a traitor. Well, most of the older people, but, <laughs> well, but, but <laughs> and you are a hero to many, but, but why, what, why was it that you wanted to get this out? What was it you wanted people to know? Well, the main thing that I encountered at the time was this vast chasm, this like huge discrepancy between what I knew and was educated as a younger, uh, you know, because I, I, I considered myself a very educated and informed citizen. You know, I, I was very, you know, I was a voracious reader. I paid attention to the news. Um, and this was even before I enlisted in, in the military. And, you know, and then I became an intelligence analyst and I was trained in this mindset and, you know, given training data to sort of do data analysis and work with large data sets and really understand this stuff. But it wasn't until... I deployed to Iraq that I was like, this is, you know, it was, it was the jadedness and the darkness that I saw in my, in the people who had deployed uh, on, a, on multiple occasions who wouldn't talk about. And I finally saw that and experienced this vast chasm between what the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in particular looked like on the ground and how that didn't comport with the sort of post Obama election media portrayal, which at the time was kind of like, maybe this wasn't so bad, right? You know, like around 2009, 2010, you know, there was this sort of um, idealization going on. And it, I found this very alarming since, you know, on the ground, it still appeared to be not necessarily an escalation, but, uh, you know, there was every indication that, you know, that uh, this was like a continuing ongoing you know, problem where, you know, there were, we were, every activity that we had, every action that we took, there was a count reaction and there was a reaction to the counter reaction, et cetera. And it was just, this is how, as I phrased it, the, uh, the true face of, um, 21st century asymmetric warfare, right. Which is action reaction. And there was a complete discrepancy between what you were seeing. And I want to talk more about that and what um, Americans were believing. Right. And, and you know, somebody's, we're going to get questions throughout and, and, with our virtual audience too. Hi. Um, somebody's asking a question about why weren't you afraid? And I want to hold on that for a second okay? because I want to learn what I learn in this book, which is so incredible, which is your origin story. So let's talk about how you got to this moment. Okay. Your dad worked with classified documents as well for the Navy in Wales. He did. He made that sound romantic to you. He met your mom, one of nine children in Wales. 
He brings the family, including your older sister, Casey, to Oklahoma to work for Hertz. Yep. Casey, already a teen. She's 11 years older than you? 11 years older than right. me to the day. Yeah, oh, to the exact we day. We share our birthday. Right. She's your idol. She's your protector. To this day. Yeah. And as your parents, who you loved, uh, retreat, disappear into alcoholism, yeah. it got ugly. It did. Um, and I didn't know it either. You know, I was too, you know, at a certain point I was, I was, I wasn't young enough. So I thought, I thought I was the problem. Mm. I thought, you know, this is like, I'm not doing well enough. I'm, you know, not performing well enough academically. I am, you know, I'm, I'm not popular enough in school. I'm not good enough at sports. I definitely felt, uh, especially for my father, like nothing was good enough for him, but it was, it was just that he wasn't there. Well, and this is running along the same track. By the way, we've been chatting, and um, this may resonate with some people, but we had a really nice conversation. Um, I told Chelsea about Al-Anon, which she'd never heard of, so I'm no. excited about the future there. But this is running along the track of your dysphoria, and which you didn't, wouldn't have a word for it then, but you're four years yeah, old. Yeah, I knew I was different. Yeah. You're four years old. Four years old. You're not influenced, and it's however many years ago, you're not being influenced by social media or by music or by videos. You're four years old and you ask your dad what about your sister and, and you in relation to you? Yeah, well, I wanted, I wanted to know if I could be like her, you know, be become essentially like have the life of my sister. When was I going to get makeup to and when was I? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, so or at least, you know, dress, you know, dress or look like her. And, you know, my father explained the sort of differences in a very methodical manner, you know, like I was like, like to it. And, you know, was, he was doing this to like where this would probably be explained to like a nine or 10 year old. But, you know, I mean, the gist of it, what I got was like, oh, the plumbing is different. I'm just like, OK. But that, four, okay, Dad. Yeah, that four-year-old asking that question that jumped out at me. And at yeah. six, at six, your dad does what he knows to do to try to guide you, you know, towards this masculinity he wants. He gives you an old IBM computer. Yeah. What happens with you, a six-year-old, in this computer? Well, uh, first time I ever got a computer. Um, you know, obviously I played with buttons, and, you know, like picked and packed at the keyboard. Um, he loaded a couple of educational games that were a bit more, you could sort of be responsive with. Um, and, uh, and as I got a little bit older, um, you know, it went from like computer gaming to programming. He started teaching older. Me you were 10, I think. Yeah. It was by yeah. around this time. And I, and this was a, around the same time as I would have, the internet would have actually had something on it because I remember we had the internet pretty early, like 1993, but it was a, at a time when. You know, I was, it was, it's not, it wasn't just that I wasn't allowed on it, it was that even if I did connect to the internet, you know, with the, mm. with the modems back then, um, a 14.4K bowed modem, uh, I, I, there was nothing on it. You know, it was just mm. sort of like empty web pages. Yeah. So you start making little videos and programming and doing all that stuff. I'm if, over my head, I'm telling you, at 10, 11 years old. And, you know, you, you go on, you're smart, you know, um, you won the science fair in school. You became the first from your school to win the academic bowl on a state level. Yes. But there's no time for this in your home because you're, you're trying to survive. Um, you, you know, uh, your dad comes at you at a belt with a belt. Yes. When you're 11, he wants you to pay rent. Yeah. He did, well, he said, you don't pay rent here. You know, it's just like, I'm, I'm in fifth grade. <laughs> and this is the first time you were strong enough to take the belt away. It was. So I fought back, you know, and the thing was, I was doing homework. So my father wanted to use the computer The the, um, we had two computers. It was my computer, um, which was getting older mm -hmm. at this point. And then there was the computer that was sort of the, the family computer, the, the home computer or whatever. And my father wanted to use his computer and he, um, he was like, well, he was very intoxicated. And I knew, I knew at this point, this is an age whenever I was like, oh, your eyes are red you're, you're clearly intoxicated. You're slurring your words. And he was just like, I I'm going to use the computer. I'm like, dad, I have homework. And I actually had, mm -hmm. I had a homework project that I was working on and it need, it required something. I don't remember what, but it, you know, I, it required me to actually use that computer as opposed to the computer mm -hmm. in my bedroom. Well, uh, you, uh, then turn around, you know, a little bit after 
taking the belt away, and he's there with a shotgun. Yes. Um, so he grabs a. Uh, he, gra- he he goes out into the. He, he had this closet, and uh, in it were you know he had several belts, uh, uh, and he had uh, he had his uh, he has he has a shotgun, uh, and apparently um, my mother intervened as well um, because my father pulled out the shotgun. Uh, she had pre intervened and removed the shells. Mm. from from it and he was too drunk to check so you know yeah. he your mom escalated from there your mom who's uh i ran away he ran away that night um your mom meanwhile uh, is collapsing in on herself with her alcoholism uh one night she attempts suicide your dad's so drunk that your sister casey who there's another moment where your mom was drunk in the front yard i hope i'm remembering this correctly and a squirrel drops a shell on her head. It was a nut. It was like a, a walnut. A nut. And I mean, I love animals. I hated seeing this. But Casey, who has sort of taken over uh, running the house, comes out with the shotgun and no, shoots. It was, a, it was a pellet gun. Pellet gun. Yeah. And shoots the squirrel. It's like she's already been labeled, you are the protector of this whole house. Right. Even And when this night happens where your mom... Attempts suicide, your dad's so drunk, Casey piles everyone in a car. You're in the back seat cradling your mom, not knowing if she's going to live. Yeah. Well, I didn't know it was like life and death. I just knew something bad was was happening. So I want to go back to that question that somebody has asked. Where did you get the bravery and the lack of fear? It feels to me like... Well, it's coming. A complex PTSD is quite a... It's quite an experience to have. Um, so it's not it's not necessarily f- a fearlessness or bravery because I definitely feel fear. I definitely mm-hmm. feel anxiety. I definitely feel, um, you know, I, I, I know, the, I think the thing is is that I kind of just work through it or ignore it and or don't notice it sometimes um, because, you know, I, I get, I get this like feeling of, uncertainty or anxiety or, um, you know, like even, even just doing like a public speaking thing like this, you know, Mm -hmm. I just work through it. I just, it just, you know, it is something that I have been through a lot. I've had this feeling in the sense a lot. And, uh, one of the coping mechanisms that I have is I just, is I, is, you know, and and it's kind Mm -hmm. of like a trick because like, especially with, with, uh, with sort of the hormones that are produced whenever you're ang- anxious, right? So, you know, that feeling of butterflies in your stomach, like you get the cortisol. So my brain doesn't register that as anxiety. It, anxi- it, it registers that as excitement. It's like, oh, it's time to go. Mm, yeah. Well, it, it, again, it's just one puzzle piece, but I've, I feel that your you know, upbringing in Oklahoma is definitely part of this puzzle that we're putting yeah. together. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, well, that, I mean, one of the reasons why it's so prominent in the book is because I wanted to tell my story, which is like this whole vivid picture of like my entire life. It's, this is a coming of age story, really. You know, I have one eye on the clock and yet I do want to stay here because, um, th- you raised in Oklahoma as a child, you heard the Oklahoma city bombing. I did first grade our way. No, well, half an hour. Okay. And that affected you, um, affected everyone you lived around. People you lived around were still angry about Waco. I mean, you bring... They were. Yeah, you bring kind of a sensibility of... Somebody's asking, is Oklahoma still a part of you? Oh, wow. Uh, I would say that uh, there's definitely a, um, a sort of strain of, um, I think, uh, robustness that uh, sort of this you know, it, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, an importation from the era, from the sort of manifest de- destiny, you know, mm-hmm. out in the frontier kind of era. It's, it's very much, you know, sort of cou- couched in this, uh, in this sort of like white, you know, taking over of obviously native lands, uh, aspect to it. But, uh, yeah, I think that there's sort of this independent, this like sense of independence of, you know, the government, you know, cause like we, we had four police officers in our town and not all of them were on duty at all at one mm-hmm. time, if, if at all. So, you know, this like, this like idea that like, oh, there's this big federal government that's coming out to get you is, is does it's non-existent really in reality, but um, it's ingrained, but it, you know, it's just like ingrained sort yeah. of like, you know, like rugged, we can go out into the, you know, it, the, we were at the edge, we were at, we were at the edge of the sort of rain band where, you know, you have, you, you have forests and the East on one side and then you have, 
you know, prairies and then out to the Rocky Mountains on the other and sort of right smack and on that line in between is like yeah. where I grew up. Well, and you could physically see that if you stood high enough where you looked out, you could see on one side, you could see that it got greener. And on the other side, you, you could see, especially at sunset, the sort of painted reds and oranges of the, of the landscape out further yeah. to the West. Well, if your family life there had tragedy. Um, the military was Kafkaesque. I'm going to fast forward. You're kind of left on your own after your dad's second wife doesn't want you in their house and your mom is trying to... Yeah, there's a brief together. interlude yeah. in the UK as well. Yeah, right? uh, yeah your mom takes school. you back to Wales. and uh, so. Uh, but then you end up with some recruiters who are like, they have struck gold with you. <laughs> they know... Yeah, they, I, show, I show up and I, and I actually thought like... Um, because I, I, the way I enlisted was, uh, was my father was encouraging me to enlist and I was trying to get back in with sort mm -hmm. of, he was trying to patch things up with my mm -hmm. father and he was just like, you should enlist in the Navy because I was in the Navy. And I was like, well, I don't really like boats. And he's just, and he's like, well, they're ships. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and then, I, and then, and then, I, I, then he told me, well, I guess you could join the Air Force. And I'm just like, oh, I don't know. Uh, and he's just like, whatever you do, just don't, don't enlist in the Marine Corps. And so I went to the recruiting center for the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. but they weren't there that day. So I, you know, across, across the hall was the Army. And yeah. uh, they were there and they were looking at me. And they figured out that they had a brilliant potential future intelligence officer. So... Off you go. You're in. We're, we're skipping over, you know, whole chapters. But you end up in Baghdad, and you describe your job as like drinking from the fire hose of intelligence to analyze what impact military decisions and personnel movements were having on the war on terror. Yep. But in reality, your life was more like life in a trauma ward. Yeah. Ta yeah. Talk about. You're in this hut. You're watching screens. You are seeing people's lives. Yours and deaths. What are you watching? Oh yeah. Uh, well, you know, there's uh, probably about. 15, 16 monitors in my office uh, alone. Um, you know, my, I had three computers, right? You know, I had mm -hmm. different classification levels. Um, and yeah, like the, 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 and you know, like there's, there, there's a lot more and I can't get into it because, you know, like... Uh, we should uh, say, right in the beginning of the book, there's an author's note. Yeah. You, you still can't talk about some of the things you saw. Yeah. Uh, Otherwise, I go yeah. back. I go back in. You go back. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, like, so there, there were streams of other, of other sources of information apart from what, what was disclosed, um, you know, that were more sensitive or, uh, or uh, more timely um, right. uh, you know, so, uh, but yeah, just sort of take, you know, what I didn't realize when I enlisted was because um, uh, when I enlisted as an intelligence analyst, uh, it was a very much charts and graphs and uh, acetate sheets and maps kind of job. Um, but the digitization had happened while I was in the army very rapidly. And uh, I very quickly uh, realized that uh, I am a data scientist. And yeah. you know, I had a background in math and you know doing, uh, doing some early, you know, and what we were really doing was what I what I was really doing was was taking this f fire hose of constant this constant stream of information and trying to make predictions about what would happen in the next 24, or 48, 72 hours. Um, you know, sort of like a weather report, only with bodies. And exactly, you know, somebody's asking, did you have any moral qualms when you went into the army? Did you, you know? We know you started seeing things that really troubled you deeply, but you didn't know that going in, did you? Oh no, no! I, yeah. I, I absolutely believed that. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I was very job focused. I was like, you know, I was like, this is, this is, this is a career opportunity for me. You know, I get to go, go do things. Um, you know, I was actually given. The, I, I don't know if, I don't know if it's, uh, if, if, if it's in the book. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, I was sort of given the opportunity. Yeah, I think it is in the book. Um, that I was given the opportunity to stay and actually do pursue a different, um, you know, stateside. Uh, um, job you know at mm -hmm. fort meade which would have been closer to home for me because my family lives in Mar you know my family mostly lives in maryland now uh and uh i i chose to deploy instead well i, I decided uh, you know because i wanted to go i you know and when i enlisted in the, the army it was because the troop surge was going on like i was attracted to the idea that i could be a part of something and maybe make a difference right. in some way and you know I, I very much believed in that well and you know you did believe even while you started to see that there were things that were complete disconnect. Uh, you write about, um, oh, let's see. Oh, you say you're still in therapy about some of the things you saw. There's the death of yeah. Rob Robert Rykoff. 
yes. 2010. He's a fellow soldier killed by a grenade that's launched from outside the post. Yeah. Hits RPG. him. RPG. Yep. RPG 7. I remember every single detail of that of that incident. Yeah. Because, as you write, first of all, you became as enraged that, as... And it's, it's actually very graphic because like, I had photos of the basically the equivalent of crime scene photos within about 17 minutes. Yeah, you had to look at those pictures. Yeah, and do math based upon the sort of trajectories. Where's and, the person who launched it? Yeah. And you're as angry as your fellow troops. You're enraged. You, yeah. You understand how that happens. I mean, this was one of yours. And also, you were just haunted by maybe could I have stopped it? I was tracking. Yeah, there's a guys. lot. I mean, um, you know, people ask me about sort of where, where I focus my brain, you know, because it's, it's not on the 20, it's not on the sort of 2010 events, uh, like the the things that are well known. It's it's m much more like if I had made a decision, you know, if I had done this particular incident differently, right? You know, uh, if I had been involved uh, a little bit more, if I hadn't left my desk at the right time, because, oh. you know, like there, there was one time when I left, when I left uh, to go to lunch and it was, or, you know, it was midnight. So it was midnight chow, which was lunch for me because I was on the night shift uh, for this period of time. And uh, I went to go look to my allotted time for lunch. So I went to go eat. And during that time, um, the combined joint uh, special operations task force, uh, CJ Sodaf, um, they showed that they, they execute, they uh, announced their arrival and uh, that they were executing an operation and which, uh, in which it was a target that I was tracking and I had updated the target packet for like where, where this individual was. And, um, the, uh, he had moved like the equivalent of like two New York city blocks away, you know, so maybe, maybe a couple hundred meters to a different uh, part of the neighborhood. Um, but they didn't update their things. So they, they went, went to the old, they went to the Intel. old, they went to the old 2007 location and, uh, and just, just left a trail of, of chaos and then left. Yeah. Well, and, I, and by the time I got there, they, the, the, the operation was already in motion and they called it a dry hole, which is the terminology for a mission fail. Well, and I just to me, this makes clear the fact that you're still gutted by not preventing the death of, of the death of a fellow soldier. Um, you're gutted by yeah. not being at your desk so you could tell a uh, uh, special ops. No, no, no. I have new information if you're going to go do this. Yeah. Y you cared about your fellow troops. I do. And I did. And then you're also seeing parallel to that your fellow troops do things that were endangering civilians. And I want to speak about one in sure. particular. Um, this is uh, the video from 2007. This is one I think we can talk about. No, I, I, yeah. uh, I, we're, we can talk about Everybody's it. Everybody's seen this. It showed, and it came, but it was new to you. You came across it. It showed an Apache helicopter strike that killed several Iraqi civilians and two Reuters journalists. Let's listen to a little of the sound from that. seen it. It's, it's horrible. I mean, this is just a tiny snapshot of what you had to see all the time, which is people gunned down. And in this case, by mistake. Yeah, in that case, uh, you know, it was a documented mistake. It was a, as opposed to a, a sort of undocumented or mistake or, you know, like a drop weapon situation. But the army uh, d declared that you know, it told another story about what happened on that video. Sure. Yeah. It was, you know, uh, some people would call it, uh, I don't know how, how uh, a CYA, a, you know, yeah. uh, cover your, your, but <laughs> your butt. situation. Yeah. Um, and how did that hit you seeing that? I mean, by the way, that's edited down. It went on for like an hour, I think. When you, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I actually like to point out that there's, that there, that there's sort of an aftermath and sort of understanding the aftermath, of the situation, and some of the soldiers on the ground, um, some of the soldiers on the ground who I've talked to uh, subsequently, um, you know, and they're sort of, they're sort of like, oh my gosh, like there's there's kids here, um, and just trying to help things. Like I just the 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 complications with that video, I, I feel like is is that it's not a black and white video. I mean, it's in black and white, but it's it's really grayscale. You can mm -hmm. really really tell 
the sort of co the complexities of this kind of situation where you know uh, uh, where somebody can be um, so desensitized and detached, and then other people on you know on the ground be like, oh my god, like this is happening. We have to do something. And you can and you you both get the the worst. You you can both get get a sense of the worst of humanity and the best of humanity right. in the same like fifteen to 30 minutes and right. you know this happened a lot well and you know the worst of humanity was some of the american soldiers kind of mocking the whole thing um have i got that right i mean yeah pilots yeah, yeah or in the some of the pilots the gunner people on the ground although you know this is common like this is extremely yeah. common you know sort of military you know parlance uh you know this is just how we t this is how we talk this is how they can do it you know they can anesthetize themselves and yeah. do it and there's a really good uh, there's a really good uh, book um, called On Killing that sort of goes into um, the desensitization process, the engineered desensitization process for soldiers in terms of yeah. you know not and how you because you know the, especially like in the firing range right you you're you're trained to see a silhouette and a target you know it's a sh and it's human shaped on purpose. Right, it's it's a it's a person, and it's shaped like a human because they used to use like crosshairs, and they they changed that to a human person. That way, you can just be like silhouette, and then you see the movement of the silhouette, and you pull the trigger, squeeze the trigger, not pull, but mm -hmm. squeeze the trigger, and uh, and then obviously take down the target. Um, you know, it's like a, it's it's this whole mechanical process of reframing and restructuring sort of how your mind processes different situations. Yeah. Um, it it sounds like you were both horrified for the civilians, but also for the American troops, again, who are in this situation. Also, what about the people at home, right? You know, who... Not knowing. Well, or not knowing, or the people who know, and they're they're just sort of not caring. You know, like the... the obviously, the, the civilian leadership had all, you know, had full knowledge of all of this. And, um, you know, the... And I mean, Congress, you know, the... Secret uh, the cabinet, you know, secretaries of state or secretaries of defense and state, um, and you know the obviously the Oval Office uh, itself and multi from multiple administrations, you know, I mean, like it's yeah. kind of a it's kind of it kind of makes you feel like you're especially whenever you're, it's unclear, you know, especially if you ask if you ask somebody like what you know because you ask somebody on the ground like why are we here and they're just the questions like you know their answer is like I don't know because my recruiter, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it's it's unclear what the purpose is to the people on the ground and this this sort of you know and it's funny that i get asked about sort of like this disillusion you know people are like oh well you became disillusioned and i i remember i remember not being this but being surrounded by people who were very jaded and very turned off by you know but by the sort of thing that was happening around us and and them being much further along in this sort of jadedness and cynicism process um than than i was and then that i sort of absorbed this through osmosis right because yeah. it was just like you know some people some of the some of the people I, I i was i was there with had served three four tours at this point and these are year-long deployments most of the people in my unit who had deployed in the previous deployment you know, served a 15 month deployment instead of a 12 month deployment because they got, they had an extension. Well, and you also had an option because you had begun in, you know, kind of exploring this new thing called WikiLeaks. I'm not sure it was called WikiLeaks yet. And there were online communities, that same thing that you were doing as a kid, you were finding communities online. Yeah, I mean, there, was a lot, there was a lot of different you yeah. know, sort of internet things, right. you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't just one particular group or, any, or anything right. like that, but you know, just sort of this you know, I guess you could call it the 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 M I M the M I R C underworld of you know computer tech tech you know nerd people, which is you know uh, which, funny enough, it was at the time pretty centered around you know here in the Boston area. So. Yes, right. And so you had this option, and maybe that gave you a little less of the jadedness. You did upload it. You uploaded that video. But I just want to also introduce the other thing that was happening. You we've talked about having to watch this data come in beat just over and over and over again yeah you know and keeping secrets about the military you're also keeping secrets about yourself uh, under don't ask don't tell sure um although well, i mean how secret that was is unclear <laughs> well but you're not allowed to talk about it i mean i found I it this is where it just gets you, you know people you, you're um seniors you're you know the officers above you the, people know there's an issue you uh, you get sent to talk to psychologists but you can't talk 
about right. yeah. I mean, what's, especially if you you know you definitely don't want it written down. Uh, no one can talk about this thing that is tormenting you. And by the way, these people who are tormenting you, you're you're not allowed to talk about it. But your higher ups had no problem calling you names. Uh, well, it was. I mean, it wasn't that they called me names as much as they they you know everybody was being called names. But it was it was particularly, uh, you know, it, it was particularly junior enlisted people who were. Um, you know, who, who, who weren't, uh, who, who didn't meet the sort of criteria of like being like this, uh, this like stereotypical, like mm. masculine dude. Right. You know, yeah. which was, uh, you know, it was, uh, we were in a very, we were, we were very, um, femme he heavy units. So we had, um, you know, or at least the, the shop, cause this is an Intel shop and we're not, yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not going out on deploy, you know, patrols or anything like that. You know, it's inside the wire kind of deal. Um, but you know, we have, uh, you know, we have 60, our shop is 60% women and, you know, but, you know, it was very male heavy leadership, uh, in the, in the positions there. And, you know, there's the sort of sexism and, you know, a uh, little bit of, uh, a little bit of the, the sort of, um, you know, kind of pervasive comedy central-esque, uh, you know, sort of racist stereotypes, right. um, that, uh, you know, and the, the, these kinds of things just sort of existing, uh, pervasively in, a, in what, you know, what I think in a civilian job would be considered a very hostile work environment. But this was, this was standard for at the time. Yeah. But you were raped. That, but that happened before, that was, that was while I was in, uh, that was before I was deployed. Right. But it was in the military. And, it was. And you can't talk to anybody about that. Uh, I deliberately didn't talk to anybody about it. I didn't report it. I didn't mention it. I, uh, what did, uh, I just tried to pretend it away. Like it never happened. Can you explain, you know, b being in this environment, what's happening to you? We were talking again before, and there was a moment in the book where there's kind of an aha for some people that I know you'd been dating the lovely Dylan here. Yes. Not, that's not his name, uh, here in the Boston area. And you, yeah, I used he, to ride the tea right there, right yeah. behind us. We see them go by. Yeah, and, um, right here on Commonwealth. You, uh, you were trying to share with him these feelings that you were trans. Uh, and he said to you, and this was like such a moment of clarity, he said, oh, I'm not comfortable with that because I, I, I like men and I like the masculinity. Sure, yeah. And this helped some people I know understand. Uh, one guy in particular who said, oh, so this isn't like a guy dressed as a woman. I said, no. Can you talk about what you're feeling like as somebody who knows you're trans and you're in this situation? It's not just, no, I'm not belittling yeah. people who are gay or uh, men who like to dress like women, but sure. what was going on inside you that you, when you couldn't talk about this and it was just. Well, I mean, I didn't know, uh, you know, I, 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 by this time I sort of knew a little bit more about sort of queer and history, trans sort of, um, language, you know, sort of the language that, you know, is much more, uh, is much more, uh, widely understood now, but I was just sort of starting to learn this stuff. And so was he, you know, it just, you know, our relationship kind of fractured and frayed a little bit, you know, in part because it was in the military and in part, you know, because, you know, just, you know, I think that, uh, after, after I sort of came out to him, uh, you know, I think, I think he was just like, oh, like, oh, I'm not into that or whatever, mm. you know, uh, but you know, like it, it came up. It came up as an issue. Well, and what I'm screaming at my book is, he was what, 18? And you're like... Uh, I think it was not. He, nine? he was 19 and I was 20. Right. Or 20 uh, uh, he was one year younger than me. So when mm -hmm. I was 22, he was 21. And I'm screaming at the book, you're so young. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's okay. <laughs> you know, there will be others. And um, yeah. yeah, but at that point, you're devastated. And again, living with this truth uh, about yourself that you can't act on at all and on a separate track the other truth which is you're seeing all of this data and i'm gonna again i'm gonna jump ahead um yeah i mean you know like uh, i got three maybe three hours of sleep and i have if at all just trying to process all of this all of like it. everything going on and you know uh not me you know like i think that um a big a sort of big sort of, sort of factor of my deployment uh, I don't know if it comes through the book is just sort of, uh, the exhaustion and the sleep deprivation, you know, the, um, you know, emotional drain, uh, but also the anxiety and the, 
the sense of like not having a center um, in my in in my everyday life, not having a, a sort of you know a place to to calm down, or just like it was just intensity, 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 intensity. And yet, uh, going ahead just a little bit, when it comes to the court martial, you really resist. Connecting the two. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to explain that. Did you, wait a second. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. like, uh, yeah. I, 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 I do connect the two, or I do, sorry, I do disconnect the two because I feel like it's a strategy by the government and by authorities to uh, sort of muddy the waters with the identity of somebody because regardless of you know every time that this happens everybody's like looking at the identity and the background of that person whenever you know something something can be. So some act can happen. It takes agency away from me, right? Mm -hmm. If you, you know, I, you know, this is fully my decision. You know, this idea that you know uh, somehow it's because of who I am. No, it, uh, you know, I, I, I was a data scientist. You know, who had enormous amounts of information and enormous amounts of responsibility. And uh, anybody in that role and anybody in that position, you could have, you know, could could have done this and and. And I know for a fact that the people contemplated, you know, not necessarily this, but, you know, similar actions. And you see this you repeated throughout the last, you know, few decades is that yeah. this has happened. It wasn't because you were trans and you, you don't, right. you know, it wasn't, you don't, you don't want to pathologize uh, trans people as like there's something well, wrong with them. Yeah. So they did a data dump. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I think, yeah. uh, I mean, it, it, what frustrates me is it's sort of just, the trying to do that takes away my agency because it's like, yeah, you know, like if, if, regardless of the background that I have, you know, some sometimes, you know, and I made decision, I made life and death decisions every day as right. well, you know, right. like it was my job. So and fought with officers. I, I loved seeing that. You, you know, an officer it's not would uncommon. come. Well, eh, an officer would come to you it's and not say, "Common in the intel shop." Yeah, here's here's my plan, and you would say. Bad plan, <laughs> you know, because you were starting. Well, it's not my plan. It's it's my assessment. Yeah, of a, right. uh, You know, my sort of weather map situation where I'm just trying to explain to an operations officer because it's you know there's a saying in the military, intel drives ops, and you know it was very clear that uh, you know ops was supposed the ops always felt that intel should draw should be driven by ops. Um, and there is sort of a feedback loop going on, but, uh, but yeah, you know, if, if I gave my assessment, if I gave my assessment of a, of a situation, it was based on, you know, I, I, you know, I had, you know, I was a data scientist, so this wasn't, this wasn't just me like looking at a dartboard and right. throwing, you know, throwing names and, and locations around, um, you know, I was, I, I had a very scientific and evidence based, based approach and I could show my work, um, just kind of. Not be ignored, but you know, sometimes it was it w wouldn't compart it wouldn't compart with the uh, with with a decision maker's sort of um, you know a, approach to things or or opinion of things. And sometimes office politics would sometimes office office politics alone would drive decision making. Oh yeah, well, but you're starting to see more and more that this ho the whole arc of the two wars was not working, and that in fact the counterinsurgency was creating more. Um, uh, failure uh, in the demonstrably. In the region. Yeah, I don't think that that yeah. requires my opinion. I right. think that uh, that pans out. Right, but data. You, so you make this huge data drop. Uh, I'm going to again skip ahead. It was, it, was, it was comparatively small to what I had access to, but yeah, you could have done more. Um, you're, it's, not, it's not just that it's it's not just that it could have done more situations. It's just you know like I you know it, it, like it, I I I think that s size and scale of things you know uh, in you know changes with time you know where you know you're 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 dealing with um, you know because like I just look at today and we're just awash in information. Right. You know if you if you said seven hundred and fifty thousand records today to any database administration, you'd be like, oh, it's nothing. Right. Well. <laughs> It's something to the government in that moment. You're arrested. You're put in solitary confinement in a Kuwaiti jail in a cell right out of Kafka. It's a well. It, it was a cage. It was a. T well, I called it the tiger cage because it was. Uh, it was like it was like a it was like a uh, like a mesh kind of stainless steel mesh thing. Something uh, you'd see on Broadway in some play. Some yeah. Uh, but it, this came from Fort Wayne, Indiana. I remember that because it was written on it. That's all you could see for over 50 days. You're in this cage. Yeah, 59 days. You, you kind of went crazy. Oh, I thought I was. I thought I, I, I'm, I, 
my brain melted. And I, that's like one of the the few gaps that I sort of have in sort of my understanding of what happened in my entire life is, you know, this sort of brain melting experience of being in a, you know, uh, it was uh, what, like 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. And, you know, it was just like 92, uh, 100, 100 degrees Cel- uh, Fahrenheit. Um, and, uh, you know, because it was Kuwait, middle of summer, like July. Uh, and, uh, and we, you know, there were two of these portable air conditioning units. There was one on one side, one on the other out in the tent. And, you know, it was just, the tent was sort of flapping around. So yeah, it was, it was cooler than the outside, which was way hotter, but you know, it was just constant. Uh, and then the dust, I just remember just the sort of sandy dust, uh, you know, cause it was winds blowing from the, from the, uh, from the Persian Gulf constantly. At one point you end up screaming and banging your head. Um, sure. Look, this became part of, the court martial, the pretrial. It's what you do in solitary confinement? Yeah. Scream and bang your head. One would. You don't know. You don't know what's going on. You have no idea the impact of uh, the information you've put out there, and the impact is. Yeah, I didn't even know if it got out. Right. So. The impact is that governments are embarrassed because a lot of it shows diplomats and cables bad mouthing each other, and it shows how poorly things are going. Uh, when it comes to your confinement, though, I want to say human rights organizations call it torture. Uh, the military said it was to protect you from yourself and self-harm because of your gender dysphoria. They tried to weaponize that against you. Yeah, uh, it was pretty successful, I'd say, you know, because I obviously stayed in there for 11 months. Yeah, to protect uh, you. Because well, they moved me to Quantico, uh, which I viewed as an upgrade because I had hot and cold running water. There was a shower. Um, you know, I uh, it was the, the temperature. I mean, the temperature control was a big was a big deal to me and sort of the sense of like, I'm home as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I remember, you know, the, uh, just seeing my, just sort of, I mean, it was behind a partition of, of, you know, like two inches of, you know, whatever plastic they use that's uh, bulletproof. Um, it's not, not even glass, but like the partition between me and my, my family, it was, uh, it was nice to see my family. It's really good. Well, um, <laughs> The, the, a lot of the court martial wasn't seen. A lot of the trial wasn't seen by anybody. They would um, keep uh, shutting it down for security reasons. Talk- well, actually, they tried to. They, they tried to make the, the their. They wanted to make the entire court martial uh, uh, closed hearing. Right. Um, obviously, we fought that. And, yeah. Because there's this constitution thing. And they wanted, they wanted you to admit to malicious intent, um, in meaning that you had meant to uh, destabilize the U.S. You had meant to help the enemy. You wouldn't do that. No, I, of course not. Yeah. And there were witnesses who came and said, no, this is somebody who cared about our military, cared about our country, cared about us doing the right thing, not just for civilians of other countries, but for yeah, the I'm, military. I'm very, I'm very, um, uh, and you know, this is, this is an admission. I, I don't recall if it's in the book or not, but, uh, I, I, I very much, um, very proud of the people that I worked with who, didn't cave to the government and just sort of gave a very factual evidence, you know, evidence based, you know, based on their opinions right. and, and their approach, you know, to, to, to the court martial. I mean, kudos on them for just telling, you know, the story of how my, how my job was. Well, even uh, Defense Secretary Gates said at a news conference that the information that you released did no harm to foreign policy. Right. Okay. Uh, but still, You've, I mean, we, we try to get him to testify at my court martial, but, uh, you know, he, he was doing other things. Well, still, uh, the government was writing his book at the time. <laughs> still, you think you're going to jail for life without parole at least. Um, Ed Snowden released, and he's a, he's a civilian who had access to documents. Contractor. Is contractor. Slight, yeah. Slight yeah. Right. Distinction. You're right. Ed Snowden, the contractor, releases documents showing the government was spying on Americans. And now you're thinking, oh, gosh, now I'm the bad leaker. He's the good leaker. You right. Know, yeah. T- well, it was also just, I mean, it, what, and, you know, this is not, this is, I mean, it's in the book, but like, it's, it's not like a, a compare contrast between me and him at all. Um, it was just sort of a, the frustration of, you know, I, I am having this big court martial and the timing of, of, of his, of his disclosures, which, you know, I'm generally supportive of, um, 
you know, but but the timing of it was didn't wasn't helpful for sort of sort of putting it on our defense, right? Because like all the press just vanished the next day. It was just like you know, like you could see the press pool was like filled up with people, and then like the next day, like the day afterwards, you know, it was like two people. It was like the diehards, right? And and so you're worried. Um, yeah, I was wor- I was worried that uh, I was worried that you know, um, I was worried that my court martial would uh, not get. Uh, we not get treated with the, 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 the seriousness by the public as, you know, because this was hitting on some hard issues and some difficult issues. Right. I, and there was a moment when your lawyers want you to cite your gender dysphoria. Yeah, it was not, it wasn't, wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to happen. Um, they used um, psychiatrists and psychologists and actually the, the I, I got diagnosed with a whole host of different things. It's called a mitigation strategy because it's, in you know, in a, in the court martial process and in the federal system in general, when it comes to these uh, you know disclo- non or these disclosure offenses that involve national security information, there's no public interest defense. So you can't be like, I did it because X. They would actually prevent me. That's one of the reasons why I didn't testify, even though I wanted to, uh, and I was pre- and I even prepared to testify. Was that you know if I had been like, this is the reason why, you know, then. Uh, that, then the court, the the judge would essentially say, "Well, you're barred from you know this 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 line of defense." So the three the three lines of defense that I had were I didn't do it, which obviously the disclosures I was behind. You know these were these were mine. Um, and uh, then there was the second potential thing, which was uh, um, sort of incapacitation, which is a little bit different than the insanity defense. It's more like it's a it's a little bit more nuanced, but essentially along those lines of like, you know, like I didn't have the mental capacity because of uh, some either either uh, disorder or because of, um, you know, uh, drug uh, drug or alcohol or substances, um, you know, in, innocent ingestion. And then there was a third one, which was the mitigation and that we had, we ended up having to, you know, put up this whole host of, uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and stuff. But that's astonishing. You couldn't say the truth, which is I did this because I think our country was making a mistake and the American people didn't know about it. You I mean, s- I, I, no, that's not even what I'm trying to say. It's not even that I'm saying that. You say that, it. What, what did you want to say? Well, it's not, it's not even that I think that, it, you know, that it's a mistake per se, you know, even, even though like I have a, an opinion that kind of leans that direction. It's more like, it, it, it's sort of like a doctor and in informed consent. Like, how can you have a public that is, that, consent without informed consent about what is happening on the ground and in the reality because you know this is what kind of offended me about sort of not knowing right you know because and you know sometimes and i think one of the bigger questions now is you know now that the public does know a lot more information you know does that count as consent you know is it is the public actually consenting to this stuff and i think that that's that's sort of a deeper it may it's a little bit more pulled back than right. the sort of I think that this is the conclusion. It's not my based on my conclu- on my like wholehearted conclusion of or of, of of that. It's more like here's here's the breadcrumbs to come up with your own conclusion. What an interesting discussion could have been had, but you were not allowed to oh, to not. testify that. Look, um, there's so much. Did I say there was so much here? There's so much here. Um, uh, you are sentenced to 35 years. Yeah, you do go to jail. I I want to just talk briefly about that because what a an incredible time of both you know h- horrible punishing stuff that comes along with prison and thinking you're going to be there for thirty five years, but also a barber, you know, who is so tender and kind to you. Yeah, and knows you don't want to get your hair cut. What does he do? Oh yeah, he just he made it like a very he he. Uh, the, so the barber school at the, uh, at the prison, cause they had a barber, they had a little barber college to call it. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they, they had to, in order for, to meet Kansas certification, they had to learn this whole host of different, um, you know, beautician techniques and, you know, uh, hair, you know, hairstyles and doing of, uh, uh, you know, doing skincare and things like that. So it was more of more, it was a bit more of a, of a barber and job and, training. Company. Yeah. Essentially, you know, v- vocational training for this. And, uh, you know, I, they got to, tr- you know, do this stuff with me and sort of, instead of using, uh, instead of using clippers, like they did with everyone else, they use shears with me. Um, you know, cause they had access to, they had to be able to train with shears. Um, you know, they, obviously they had the points, a little, a little, the edges were uh, a little, uh, were a little, you know, nubbed off. 
Um, it was but, traumatizing for you to have a buzz cut. It was traumatizing. Yeah, you know, I just didn't want to, because like a buzz cut was like made it really short, right? You know, so I used, they used sheer, you know, so um, yeah, I, I had a barber. It was sort of my conventional barber and I would, and he would make it as pleasant an experience as possible. And also like the advantage that he had was that he got to practice these sort of techniques and different things. He was threading your eyebrows. He did. I just found that so tender. Yeah. You know, to offset, which were some, some pretty horrible moments, uh, you know, fights and stuff. But in prison, you fight and win for the right to start taking the medication to transition. Yeah. So, yeah, I fought to get hormones, um, which uh, ended up being a public fight, obviously, because we had to go to court. Um, and... Uh, yeah, because, you know, the whole, pro I mean, one of the most frustrating things about this whole process is that, you know, I, I, I had to, I essentially had to come out publicly in order to get, because I knew that, that like, if I had sought, you know, gender care, mm -hmm. uh, you know, gen, you know, um, gender affirming care while in prison, that it was going to go before the court. So I, I came out publicly on August 22nd, 2013. I finally came out publicly and I was like, I'm trans. This is who I am. This is my name. Uh, I remember my lawyer uh, I actually said I was a woman, like in, in the letter, in the, in the letter, he goes, he goes, uh, and write, he writes it down, puts it, uh, in, uh, in a letter and prints it out. And then the next day he changed it to female. Cause he was just like, I oh, just, dude, <laughs> like David, what are he you doing trying. here? But you know, like, you know, it was, it was, it was fine. So I just signed it and it was right on the today show. And I was like, Oh, you know, I didn't even know this had happened because I was whisked off to Fort Leavenworth immediately. But, um, you know, uh, yeah. So I, apparently my coming out was like a big deal. Well, and that's a sad moment too, because you don't again have agency there. Your family finds out something before you have to time. Oh to yeah, this, yeah. You so don't there, even yeah, know there was happening. a journalist who um, who dug into the the into my past, and uh, it was actually a magazine article. I think it was uh, I think it was um, I can't remember the magazine, but uh, Steve Fishman was the was the author, and he came out with this long form piece, and that was how my family found out that yeah. I was that you know about sort of the fact that I was trans. Uh, and that a lot of different things were happening sort of behind the scenes that my family didn't know about, even though they kind of suspected, but you know, the, the way they found out for sure was in 2011 yeah. through this article. Again, I have an eye on the clock. Where are we all going afterwards? Because <laughs> there's so much more and you know, there's well, so much I'd like to ask you about. Uh, I, 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 the, the main thing that I focus on now is um, cause a lot of people ask me about sort of government secrecy, right? And it's just like, it's just it, the context and the time is very different. You know, there are not very many things that the public is not generally aware of anymore. Um, what is happening now is that um, the, is that and, and even corporations. So it's now, you know, corporations are, have become much deeper and more, much more powerful institutions in the last, uh, in the last 10 years in particular. Um, and I think that uh, what has happened is that uh, we're now awash in information with information coming from so many different sources and we bleed our in own information. So our own privacy is just sort of like melting away with our, w with the amount of interactions that we have with the digital world. And, uh, and it's now we're just so awash in information. It's verification of the, that pro it's verification of information. It's, so it's knowing information that's useful and information is verified versus information that just gets you riled up and just has this viral spread. So do you think this ultimately, I mean, by the way, how old were you? Were you 22 when you leaked the information? Have I got that right? 22? Uh, yeah. 22. So. How old were you when uh, Barack Obama, President Obama, uh, pardoned you and you left jail after six or seven years instead of 35? I think it was, uh, 20, 29. So that's a, that's a turn 30. I was free when I was 30. So, well, th that's a, a hell of a long time. And I asked what the New York times in their glowing review asked, D is this a redemptive story? We have more transparency. You are, um, a no, woman? I, 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 I mean, I'm not, I didn't, pitch it as that. I don't view it as that. I don't think that it, that, that, that it's that way. I think it's, I think that this is just a, you know, and again, like it keeps on happening again and again throughout the story is, is that, you know, institutions are just completely unable to 
cope or you know it seems like society is very unable to cope or understand this world this like information based world that i that i that i've been swimming in since i was a child mm -hmm. right you know the the idea of you know uh, you know now now you know it, i look at uh I look, there's some more recent statistics that show that you know in 2019 nine percent of people were quote unquote extremely online um you know in places that had widespread um you know, internet access. And then that jumped up to 30%, you know, after the pandemic. Uh, so by 2021, it's now 30, uh, approximately just under 30% of people are now quote unquote, extremely online, meaning they're on their social, uh, on their social media accounts and, and on their devices, you know, like a third, that's almost a third of adults that are extremely online now. Well, uh, okay. A quick question. Uh, someone's asking, do you believe the internet could become increasingly coordinated with the defense establishment to stifle or silence future whistleblowers i mean it's I, I just you know it's it's such a different time it's just such a different time yeah uh, i think that uh you know what we're seeing now is uh fragmentation of the internet there's different internets depending on where you are you there's different inter internets depending on what on what social media posts you like you get different information based upon your sort of algorithmic things and what's happening now is that it's not so much that the the government is coordinating it's that you know there's all these different factions and and uh, different things that, that sort of, you know, that, uh, that, that spread misinformation or disinformation, right? You know, where, right. and that, where you can have something, like the government can do things in open now, and there, then you'll have uh, some mouthpiece who are just like, this isn't happening, this is what's happening. It's this like convoluted story, right? Well, speaking of which. And this is happening all over, this is, I mean, not so much in the US, but definitely all over the world. Well, it is happening in the US, as we know. And I mean, it is happening in the US, but it's not so much the, the US government, it's like, uh, it's uh, the partisan, you know, um, the, the sort of, the, the, I mean, obviously the far right has taken, advan has taken enormous advantage of this, but also large, uh, l large establishment political parties, I think, you know, p particularly the GOP, you know, have, have leveraged these sort of tools in recent years, um, but not, not, not to the same extent as I think like Russian disinformation right. or. Well, uh, we're still reminded that. Um, I uh, think, I think what is happening is that, um, you know, China, I think realized very early on the 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 power of the internet and they cracked down on it immediately and they they were like oh okay and then now the liberal dem democratic nations are sort of reeling with you know what an open internet which is different than an open society an open internet is very is a very different sort of way of viewing this and i think that uh, that that we are we're going to have to grapple with what you know how information is shared, how information is spread, how information um, is consumed uh, in a in a very uh, experimental way, and a break things or you know break break things and fix it later uh, thing, which we've inherited from the sort of Silicon Valley of the early two thousands. Couple quick questions, and I, I'm sorry, I know there have been so many, but a couple quick questions, especially you have a lot of supporters here. I can hear the sympathetic nodding. I can hear sure. nodding. Um, uh, but we're going to be uh, airing this on uh, here now across the country. Speak to the people who still think they haven't read your book, still think that what you did uh, was the act of a traitor and you endangered U.S. troops. I mean, I just look at the court martial. Just look at the record of the court martial. I mean, it's as simple as that. I just look at that and I say, look, well, you know, because like, the defense secretary said there wasn't anything endangered. And it's not, it's not just that it's just like, you know, and I can't talk about the evidence in the court martial, right. unfortunately, but you know, I just, you know, I just say, look, look at that, you know, and maybe that won't change your mind, you know, and you know, and you're never going to be able to change the mind of, uh, especially cause it's, it tends to be people who are, I mean, I, I've, no, I've noticed that it tends to be people who are over the age of about 45 or 50 who have these kinds of opinions. So I think it's a generational thing as well. Yeah. So, and, I well, don't, and I just don't think that older people, you're going to be able to convince them. Well, but it's clear. Again, you say, look at the court martial. It's clear uh, the witnesses who are all from I mean, the military. This, this isn't even like yeah. a battle that I want to have yeah, today right, because right. it's like, look at how different, like, look at what's happening in the U.S. today. <laughs> well, and that brings me to, uh, again, to finish that thought, the people who testified for you were from the military and who said you cared greatly about the military and that was in part why why you did this um but we're also reminded of reality winner 
who was the young woman who leaked the in- yeah. one intelligence report about Russian interference in the 2016 election. She was sent uh, to jail for five years, three months, 2016. Donald Trump was adamant that he wanted a scapegoat for that leak. Okay. Donald Trump, we now know, had more classified documents illegally than just about anyone. You're... I mean, your thoughts well, the, is yeah. y- you were in prison for classified documents. He was sitting in Mar-a-Lago, former president, and reality winner was sitting in jail, but he was sitting in Mar-a-Lago on classified documents. Allegedly, and we'll add that. Okay, <laughs> uh, that, reportedly. Uh, yes. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, there's always sort of been an... Un- there's always been a, this double standard, right, between... And this is not new. This is not something that just popped up in... 2022, right? There's always been a double standard between um, what happens when anything happens to like a junior or middle level uh, government employee, military member, contractor versus what happens at the cabinet level, cabinet level officials, um, and obviously going up to the White House. Uh, I don't recall anything historically that, that, that's quite gone to the gone, gone to that level. But I mean, historically, we've just never seen consequences for this kind of thing at that level. I mean, and there's sort of like a there's sort of an understanding, especially among people who, regardless of political party, that you know, hey, you know, we don't want to we don't want to dig too deeply here. You know, we want to use it for political. You know, we want to make this an electoral issue as opposed to uh, a, a legal issue as much as we can. And uh, and I think that that tendency uh, that that tendency is just sort of continuing it's just the continuance of the of the last sort of you know the 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 post uh, the post first world war sort of approach to this kind of thing uh you talk about both the the, the dump of the leak the, you talk about both the leak and your own transitioning as being an unburdening um how are you feeling how am I feeling? Uh, you know, I'm feeling, I mean, in my own life, I'm feeling a lot more centered and grounded than I've ever been. Um, you know, I have, uh, I'm, I'm a security consultant. I've got a lot of, I've got, I've been very busy with clients. In fact, you know, like right before doing this book tour, uh, I was traveling a lot, you know, meeting with clients and things because p- the sort of post pandemic, um, you know, travel wave sort of happened. Uh, and I, and I, and I've been uh, doing that more. Um, and, uh, now I have, uh, and now obviously I've written this book, which is supposed to be the definitive Chelsea, you know, early life story. Um, so I can hopefully start to talk about other things than the things that, which are, I think more alarming, um, which is the stuff that, that we have in front of us, which is, you know, the, um, you know, cause like we have a very, you know, we have a very rough few decades ahead of us as the, um, Post world as the post Second World War and post Cold War sort of uh, establishments and structures uh, are challenged and start to, to to warp and fray under the pressure of of this new era. Um, you know, with climate, with obviously uh, climate change happening, um, with um, the rise of uh, reactionary politics in the far right, um, with uh, uh, an inc- with the sort of uh, overdependence on uh, on you know, the, the uh, consumer capitalist culture that we've sort of developed around, uh, around easy, uh, around fast sort of products coming in fa- very fast. What happens when that system is disrupted by, you know, things like COVID or things like, you know, climate change uh, impacts, um, you know, like the, re- the radical reshaping of the entire world that we're experiencing now and we have been experiencing as that ramps up uh, into, you know, uh, if you look at a map, uh, from before the First World War, it looks very different. There hasn't been a major redrawing of um, of maps or of sort of the structures of how we do things in society um, in quite some time uh, since since the Cold War, since the end of the Cold War. Is I think the last time that it was a, sort of a a, a, a mild shift. Um, you know, so we're, so we're entering a different era, and you know, I'm I'm quite alarmed. I'm alarmed by this era. I'm optimistic generally uh, that we'll be able to figure things out and be able to solve these things. But I think that we 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 have we have harder times immediately in front of us over, over the next 10, 15 years. It sounds like Chelsea Manning wants to get to work. I am working. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was work working on. right before you know I got here, <laughs> <laughs> and you'll go back to it again. The book is "Read Me Text: uh, 
available for sale right outside. I can't recommend it enough. Chelsea Manning, thank you so much. Thank you. Chelsea Manning, everyone. Thank you all. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Robin. Um, and thank you to our partners at Brookline Booksmith. As Robin mentioned, you can grab a copy of readme.text uh, out in the lobby, signed by Chelsea. It's very cool. Um, coming up next here at City Space, join us for a celebration of 50 years of Agni, a beautiful beacon of international literary culture. An evening with readings and music and performances by Joanne Beard, Victoria Chang, and Teju Cole. And three-time US Poet Laureate, Robert Pinsky. He's going to MC too. That's Friday, November 4th. Find tickets at wbur.org slash events. One more time for Chelsea Manning. Thank you.